Beside the old Elamite city of Shushan, there flows the small river of Ulai. And on the bank of this river is the traditional tomb of the prophet Daniel. If Daniel could wake up and look around him, I'm sure he would immediately say, I must be in the last days of this world's history. You see, when his visions were ended, the angel said to him, and I quote from Daniel chapter 12 and verse 4, But you, Daniel, shut up the words and seal the book until the time of the end. Many shall run to and fro, and knowledge shall increase. Well, right over his tomb are fluorescent electric lights, and nearby traffic roars up and down between Abadan and Tehran. So indeed knowledge has increased, and men are running to and fro. So these were the days of the great Medo-Persian Empire, and David will be showing you around Persepolis, which means the Persian city. I wish I could take you to Persepolis. It's a fantastic place. And it's a wonderful place to visit. I've been there many times. But it so happens that just at the present time, the Ayatollah Khomeini is the man in charge of Iran. And it's not a healthy place to be unless you're a Muslim and a fundamental one at that. However, I've been there many times. Let me show you some pictures of what is to be seen in these fantastic ruins of Persepolis. Looking out over the city from the nearby hilltop, you can see the ruins spread out beneath you. And there's a lot of it, acres and acres of it. And then looking close up, you walk up these steps. You've got to pay your money, of course, to get into the ruins at this little box office. And then up the steps onto the great platform on which the city was built, a man-made platform. And here you see the steps leading up and the reliefs on the wall as you go. Strange to say, or interesting it is, that here you can see the soldiers of the Medo-Persian alliance, a Mede and a Persian, a Mede and a Persian. See them side by side. And so it was the Medes and Persians who ruled at this time. And then you come to the great Apadana or audience hall. Two great wing bulls stand at the entrance. And there's a lot of pillars here. I just wonder how long they're going to stand there. You know, some of them look as though they could fall over with a decent breeze. And an earthquake will surely bring them down. And then there is this picture of Darius. It's a relief of Darius fighting the Persian symbol of evil. And... Uh, then you see him, of course, being victorious. And then you can see the reliefs of the Persian king, Darius. And behind him is his son, Xerxes. And you will notice that in the hand of Darius, there is a scepter. And if he holds out the scepter to you, you're in good luck. You can have an audience. If not, well, it's bad news for you. And so the king of Persia is depicted here with his scepter. Now, not very far away from Persepolis are the tombs where the great Persian kings were buried. And up on the face of the cliff here, you can see the tombs where Artaxerxes, Darius and other kings were buried. Then we notice not very far from here is an interesting fire altar. You see, the Persians were not idolaters. They worshipped the elements, fire, water, air, and the earth. And these were sacred symbols to them. And so when somebody died, you couldn't contaminate or defile any of these elements by a dead body. So what to do with a dead body? If you can't burn it, if you can't bury it, if you can't throw it into the river, what do you do with a dead body? Well, they had the answer. And that is, they exposed it for the vultures. Now, when the Persians were driven out of 
Persia, that is those who adhered to the old Zoroastrian religion, they fled to India and they are now known as the Parsis. <coughs> now the Parsis also have this problem and so they have what they call Towers of Silence and I've been to these Towers of Silence. You can't go inside of course, not even Persians are allowed inside there. Only two men carry the naked body through the gate into this Tower of Silence and then the vultures swoop down and within about 10 minutes there's only dry bones left. And so you have the city of Persepolis, you have the burial place of the kings, the fire altar, all this in connection with the great city of Persepolis. But then they had another great city, it was called Shushan. Let's go there. Well, here we are at Shushan and the archaeologists have been at work here. The tell itself is quite large, it's about a square mile, nearly four kilometres in area and here the archaeologists have dug down really deep. They've exposed the old streets and the houses and villages that were once here but up on top of the tell they built themselves a castle. Now this was not just for their comfort, it was for their protection so that they wouldn't be bothered by the local people who are always very curious you know want to see what's going on but it's not altogether helpful for the archaeologists and also a place to store the things that they found from this place and so the French archaeologists have been working here since the year 1901. Now over on the far side of the tell is the river Ulai and here is the tomb of the prophet Daniel of course, Queen Esther lived in this place and it was here that the graphic events of the Book of Esther occurred. And the archaeologists have exposed what was the palace of the great kings of Persia in this place. And you can even see the place where the harem was. That would be where Queen Esther was. Well, Daniel the prophet is said to have been buried here and this is his tomb by the river Ulai. I suppose if Daniel was to awaken today, he'd say, well, this is it. You know, he said, or he was told by the angel, shut up the words and seal your book, Daniel, to the time of the end. Many shall run to and fro and knowledge shall be increased. And he'd look up and he'd see these fluorescent lights. He would see the jets zooming overhead because this is on the direct route between Abaddon, the great oil center, and Tehran, the capital of Persia or Iran today. And so the prophet Daniel was here, right by the river Ulai, when he had an interesting vision. It's recorded in Daniel chapter 8. He says, In the third year of the reign of King Belshazzar, a vision appeared to me, to me Daniel, after the one that appeared to me the first time. I saw in the vision, and it so happened while I was looking, that I was at Shushan, the citadel, which is in the province of Elam, and I saw in the vision that I was by the river Ulai. So here's the setting, right here by this little river Ulai, near the city of Shushan, today called Shush. Then I lifted up my eyes and saw, and there, standing beside the river, was a ram which had two horns. Now, you know, there's some people who say, well, you can make Bible prophecy mean anything. Oh, no, you can't. There are some prophecies which are a little vague, but let me tell you, there's a lot of prophecies that are very, very specific. And you can't make this mean anything but what it says. Here in verse 20 it says, The ram which you saw having the two horns, they are the kings of Media and Persia. You can't do anything else with that. So here is a symbol of the great Medo-Persian Empire. Now we are told, <coughs> I saw the ram pushing westward, northward, southward, so that no beast could stand before him. He did according to his will and became great. But then it says in verse 5, as I was considering, suddenly a male goat came from the west across the surface of the whole earth without touching the ground. The goat had a notable horn between his eyes. Again, you can't make this mean two things. It's only one. And the goat represents the Macedonian invade. came from the west, you see. And that's where Alexander and his armies came. And this is not just guesswork because it says here in verse 21, the male goat is the kingdom of Greece. The large horn that is between his eyes is the first king, that is Alexander the Great.
And so we have the Macedonian invasion. And then we find here it was to be followed by the breakup of the Macedonian Empire. It says in verse 7, I saw him confronting the ram. He was moved with rage against him, attacked the ram, broke his two horns. Therefore the male groat grew very great. Remember, Persia was to be great. Macedonians were to be very great. And when the, he became strong, the large horn was broken. Now, kings don't usually die when they're strong. It's when they're weak and old and feeble. But here was a king who was to be deposed or he was to die when he was strong and that's what happened with Alexander. He was only 32 years of age, just in the peak of his manhood when he died in Babylon. And of course he didn't have any child, any son to succeed him. And so it says, the large horn was broken, in place of it four notable ones came up, one toward the four winds of heaven. And so there were to be four kings in the place of the one. And that's exactly what happened because his kingdom was divided among his four generals. Cassander took Greece and Lysimachus took Turkey and Seleucus took the land of Syria and Palestine and Ptolemy took Egypt. And so you've got these four subdivisions of the Macedonian Empire, just exactly as the Bible says. Now it says, out of one of them came a little horn which grew exceeding great. Now it's only a little horn, but it became exceeding great. You see, first you've got great, then you've got very great, now you've got exceeding great. And that, of course, very aptly describes the great uh, empire of Rome, which became the greatest of all these empires of the past. Now we are told concerning Rome, he even exalted himself as high as the prince of the host, and by him the daily sacrifices were taken away, and the place of his sanctuary were cast down. Now the Romans came to Jerusalem and completely destroyed the temple at Jerusalem. And so the place of the Jewish sanctuary was cast down. Then a question was asked, verse 13. Then I heard a holy one speaking, that would be one of the angels, and another holy one said to that certain one who is speaking, how long will the vision be concerning the daily sacrifices and the transgression of desolation, the giving of both the sanctuary and the host to be trampled underfoot? In other words, how long would this destruction of the sanctuary go on and the sanctuary be obscured, the great sanctuary truth be obscured? And the answer was given unto 2,300 days, or evenings, evenings and mornings means the same thing, you know. In Genesis 1 it says the evening and the morning was the first day. So 2,300 days. Now, in Ezekiel 4 and in verse 6 we are told that a day in prophecy symbolizes a year. So here is a period of 2,300 years. Let's put that on the board so that we can just illustrate it and see what we are talking about, right? 2,300 years. All right, now, where do we begin? What marks the commencement point of this prophecy? You can read Daniel chapter 8 right through and you won't get a clue as to when it begins and, of course, therefore, you can't work out when it ends. Why? Why would God give a prophecy and not give a beginning or an ending? The reason is given in verse 27. And I, Daniel, fainted and was sick for days. Afterward I arose and went about the king's business. I was astonished by the vision, but no one understood it. Of course they couldn't because no beginning date had been given. Daniel and his friends could not understand it. Well, some years went by and then Daniel was praying and he had another vision. The angel appeared to him again. It says in chapter 9, verse 21, While I was speaking in prayer, the main man Gabriel, whom I had seen in the vision at the beginning, being caused to fly swiftly, touched me about the time of the evening oblation. And he informed me and talked with me and said, O oh, Daniel, I have now come forth to give you skill to understand. Now remember, he said nobody understood the vision. Now the angel says, understand. Ha <laughs> ha. So here was to be given the final information about this time prophecy. 
He says, consider the matter and understand the vision, that is, this vision of the 2,300 days. All right, now here is given this shorter period that we've already discussed. Seventy weeks are determined for your people, and it says in verse 25, Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the commandment to restore and build Jerusalem under Messiah the Prince shall be seven weeks and sixty-two weeks. Now here is a period of sixty-nine weeks, and it's obviously marking the beginning of the both periods. And it says, from the going forth of the commandment to restore and to rebuild Jerusalem. Now, that decree was issued by King Artaxerxes of Persia in the year 457 BC. Now, the 457th BC would be 456 complete years before Christ. Now, this period of 69 weeks, do a little rapid multiplication by seven, and you will find that that comes to 483 days or years. My writing is terrible, isn't it, eh? But if you subtract 456 from 483, what do you get? You get 27 AD. In other words, we'll put here 27 AD, and that is the very year in which Jesus Christ was baptised. All right, now seeing as the first part of it is confirmed by fulfilled prophecy, we can have confidence in the rest of it. Subtract 456 from this, and what do you get? 1844. So the termination of this point is 1844 AD. Now, don't forget the question that was asked. How long would the truth concerning the heavenly sanctuary be obscured? Under 2,300 days, in other words, until 1844. What happened then? That was the year in which a lot of people were expecting Jesus Christ to return. You see, they had studied this very prophecy. They knew it was going to be fulfilled in 1844. And they thought that the cleansing of the sanctuary was the return of Christ to this world to purify the world by fire. You see, they hadn't done their homework quite enough. They had the dates right, but they had the wrong event, and they were expecting Christ to return in 1844. He didn't come. Oh, it was a bitter disappointment to them. So, what did they do? Well, they had another look at the prophecy. And what does it say here? That then shall the sanctuary be cleansed. What is the cleansing of the sanctuary? Remember, the sanctuary is in heaven. The earthly sanctuary had been destroyed in 70 AD. It must be referring to the heavenly sanctuary. And what is the cleansing of the heavenly sanctuary? Well, we, they discovered the truth of the heavenly sanctuary in 1844, and then they went on to understand what is meant by the cleansing of the sanctuary. Let's have a look at Mr. Winterton's model of the sanctuary to understand that. Once a year, there was a special ceremony conducted at the tabernacle or the sanctuary. And this was the one occasion in the year when the high priest went into the inner apartment of the sanctuary. Before he did that, he was required, first of all, to take a bullock and sacrifice this. You see, a priest had a bigger responsibility than the common people, and so his sacrifice had to be bigger because he was more guilty if he did make mistakes. He had more responsibility. And so he took this bullock and sacrificed it, and the blood was taken into the inner apartment of the sanctuary and sprinkled on the mercy seat, as it was called, which was where the Ten Commandments were. Now, just so that we can see what happened here, uh, let us ask Mr. Winterton to remove these four coverings that were over the sanctuary, and then we'll get a good look inside. Now, you'll notice that there were two veils, one here and one at the entrance to the inner apartment of the sanctuary. Okay, so we'll take this one off first. Thank you, Mr. Winterton. And then we'll take the other one off so that we can see right inside there. All right, now you'll notice that inside here, there is the Ark of the Covenant where the Ten Commandments were, uh, and this is all symbolic of the presence of God. So, the blood of the bullock was taken in there and sprinkled, and then the high priest came out, and then he took 
two goats. Now, we've already pointed out that a sacrificial animal whose blood was spilt was symbolic of the sacrifice of Jesus Christ on the cross, wasn't it? Behold the Lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the world, John the Baptist said concerning Jesus. And uh, whether lamb or goat, the same thing. Now he took these two goats, and would you believe it, he cast lots over them. And one of them was chosen to be the Lord's goat. And the other one was designated as the goat for Azazel, or he was a symbol actually of the devil or Satan. The reason I say that is because the Lord's goat was sacrificed, the blood was spilt. The other goat was not sacrificed, its blood was not spilt. And without shedding of blood there is no remission of sin, so there's no way that that represents the Lord Jesus Christ, you see. Now he took the blood of this goat and took it into the inner apartment of the sanctuary and sprinkled it there before the presence of God. And then he came out and confessed all the sins of the children of Israel over this live goat. And then he committed it to the hands of a capable man, a strong man, who then led it into the wilderness and there it perished with the sins upon it. Now what's the meaning of all this? It's very interesting. This live goat, of course, being sacrificed was a symbol of the Lord Jesus Christ and his sacrifice on the cross. And the work that was done in here was a work of judgment. You see, this was the uh, Yom Kippur, the day of judgment that was celebrated on this 10th day of the seventh month. And the Jewish people today still recognize Yom Kippur as the judgment day. And so this represented the blood of Christ being offered as a sacrifice for our sins in the judgment day. And it was also referred to as the cleansing of the sanctuary. The sanctuary was cleansed or the objects here were purified on this day by this spilt blood. Now after the work of judgment was finished, then the high priest came out and confessed the sins over the live goat. This was not sacrificed. It represented the responsibility of Satan. You see, the devil has not only got a lot of his own sins to account for, but he is responsible for the sins that he has tempted other people to commit. He is not a sacrifice on our behalf. He is simply getting the consequences of his own temptations that he has imposed on God's people. And so he's punished not only for his own sins, but for the sins he commits others, to, he tempts others to commit. That's only fair enough, isn't it? Serves him right. And so this animal was taken away and it was allowed to perish in the wilderness. All right, now I have said that this represents the cleansing of the sanctuary. We have already pointed out that the sanctuary is a symbol or a model of the great sanctuary of God in heaven. Therefore, this work of cleansing or judgment that goes on in this inner apartment of the sanctuary symbolizes the great judgment day in heaven. Now, you might say, but just hold on a minute. Do you mean to say that there's anything in heaven that needs cleansing? Surely heaven is a clean place. Surely heaven doesn't need any housekeeping to clean it out or anything like that. Well, just before you start using any reasoning, just let's notice what the Bible says about this. In Hebrews and in chapter 9 and in verse 23, now this is not I that am saying this, this is what the Bible says, listen. Therefore it was necessary that the copies of the things in the heavens should be purified with these, but the heavenly things, notice it mentions things in heaven, heaven's a real place, and it's got these real items of the sanctuary up there, including the Ark of the Testament with the Ten Commandments. It says, but the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices than these. So there you are. The Bible says that heavenly things were purified or cleansed by something better than the blood of goats or animals. It was cleansed by the blood of Jesus Christ. Well, why did it need cleansing? What was there to cleanse? Let me read to you what it says here in Acts chapter 3 and in verse 19. Peter is preaching on the day of Pentecost and he says, Repent therefore and be converted that your sins may be blotted out. 
so that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord and that he may send Jesus Christ who has preached to you before. Now notice, before Jesus Christ comes back to this world, there's something needs to be blotted out or cleansed from the books of record in heaven, and that's the record of our sins. You wouldn't like to get up there to heaven, would you, and find that the books up there that have recorded all your sins have still got them all recorded there? Why, somebody would say, hey, you ought to have a look at here. Here's all the sins of DK down. I wouldn't want that. No, but in the great judgment day, when it is found that I have accepted Jesus Christ as my Saviour and I'm covered by His precious blood, my sins are going to be not only forgiven, they'll all be blotted out so there'll be no trace of them. That is what heaven needs cleansing of, the record of our sins. So you see, there is a work of judgment, there is a work of cleansing and purification in heaven, getting rid of the record of our sins up there. All right, well now, what really goes on in this great judgment day? In 1 Peter chapter 4 and in verse 17 it says, For the time has come, or it should be really translated will come, the time will come for judgment to begin at the house of God. You see, people who don't accept Christ are automatically condemned. They're condemned already according to John 3, 18. If you don't believe that Christ died for you, You've got to pay the penalty for your own sins. There's no question of whether you're going to be forgiven or not if you don't choose to be forgiven. But if you have been forgiven, it is possible to change your mind, you know, and turn away from Christ. So when forgiveness is recorded against your name, we've got to figure out, or God has to figure out, whether that forgiveness has been maintained. And that's what the judgment in heaven is for. Not to decide whether you whether the bad people are going to heaven or not, but whether the people, judgment must begin at the house of God, whether God's people have lived up to their profession of faith or not. And then if they have, their sins are blotted out. Now the standard in this judgment is recorded in James chapter 2 and in verse 10. Listen to this carefully because we're all going to face up to a judgment. For whosoever shall keep the whole law and yet stumble in one point, he is guilty of all. Some people say, well, it doesn't really matter if you just keep, uh, don't keep one of the commandments, just as so long as you keep nine. Oh, no. Here it says, if you stumble on one point, you're guilty of the lot. For he who said, do not commit adultery, also said, do not murder. You see, it's speaking here about the law of Ten Commandments. So speak and so do as those who will be judged by the law of liberty. It's a law of liberty. Keep it and you go free. Break it and you're in bondage to sin and the devil. And so, so speak and so do as those who will be judged by the law of liberty. And so we're going to be compared by this great standard in heaven, God's Ten Commandments, and that includes the fourth commandment, the seventh day Sabbath. And so if we want our sins blotted out by Christ in that great day, then the thing to do is choose to believe in Christ for the forgiveness of sins so that your sins can be blotted out and choose to keep all of his commandments by his grace and by his strength, including the seventh day Sabbath, because this is going to be the great standard in the judgment day in heaven, which has been going on since 1844. Who knows how soon it will come to your name. Believe in Christ and choose to follow him and keep his commandments. In our next program, we'll be showing you the ruins of the city of Rome and telling you about the two great wonders that the disciple John saw in the sky.